9. You know what happened in Leviticus chapter 8 and 9? The priests were ordained. They were ordained to be priests. They were ordained, that's why they put Moses did that on their right lobe and their right hand and their right toe. Why? So what, what would be the significance of this? It would be a reminder. The healed one would be reminded of something. The healed one would be reminded of God's grace to the priest. The priest didn't deserve that. And guess what? The priest would be reminded of God's grace to the healed one. The healed one didn't deserve to be healed either. One must be cleansed. One must be clean to come into contact with the holy again. It had to happen. And that's what we need to understand. We must understand that we are helpless. We are weak. We are fragile. Can't save ourselves people. We need God. We need Him. Paul understood that in Philippians chapter 3. He says, I, can't, I consider everything lost that I may know Christ, the surpassing value of knowing Christ, that I may gain Christ. Do we have that mindset today as Christians? We understand that we're helpless, weak, and fragile. We can't save ourselves. We need God. And not just for the salvation to save the sinner's prayer. All the time. Someone who does not know Christ, if you are here today and you do not know Christ, this passage is saying something to you. That you can still have fellowship. You can be restored. You don't need to be separated. You're separated. Our rebelliousness, our sin has separated us from God. Because God is holy and God is righteous and He must punish sinners. But Jesus, the Holy One, he became unclean so we can be holy. So you can be credited with righteousness as you trust Christ and repent of your sins. Do that and you will be saved. Water was needed to cleanse, to purify. And did you notice too in the text the number of times we see make atonement. Did you see that? In verse 18, 19, 20, 29, 31, 53, make atonement. Make atonement. Why? Complete holiness is required to have God's presence with His people. So, there must be a blood atonement. There must be a sacrifice. Atonement must be made. A man or a woman was pronounced clean, but there must be a guilt offering a sin offering, a burnt offering, and a grain offering. The healing reminds a person of the sacrifice of God. The sacrifice of God, which is also needed to cleanse away our pollution. You're Christian. Is your life polluted? Do you have a polluted life? It is. We're polluted with our sin. Does the sin that you did last night, does that remind you of your pollution? Does the sin that you did last week, does that remind you of your pollution? The sin that you did last month, the sins that you committed last year, the sins that you committed ten years ago, does that remind you of your pollution? This week Christ died for you. This week Christ had to die. Remind yourself of the gospel. Remind yourself of the atonement that was needed for you because you are a polluted person and you're looking at one or two. We're polluted people. We need to be cleansed. And that's why Christ had to die for us, brothers and sisters. Healing requires blood sacrifice because remember, all disease and all sickness is indirectly the result of sin. We need a blood sacrifice to bring us back into fellowship with God. We need a blood sacrifice to bring us back to the fellowship with God. There's no other option. There's no other way. It's the only way. And since God is sovereign, He can tell us what is that way, and that way is right. And, and it is God Himself who provides the sacrifice. 
Because God is the one who healed. And God himself, who is the sacrifice. God himself became the sacrifice. And that's in our Lord Jesus. God provides it. He provides it in himself. When God took on human flesh, and he lived the perfect life, and was crucified as a substitute for sinners, there must be forgiveness. For there to be forgiveness of sins, there must be atonement. There must be a shedding of blood. And that's what Christ did. Notice how Leviticus is doing this. It keeps pointing us forward. It keeps pointing us forward to what the New Testament is going to be about. It keeps pointing us forward to what Christ is going to do. It keeps pointing us forward to what Jesus is going to accomplish. That's what he keeps doing. Something else I want to point out as well. Did you notice in verses 33 to 53, it was interesting how what was done for people, atonement, was the same as what should be done for buildings? Go to chapter 14, go to verse 53. However, he shall let the live bird go free outside the city into the open field, so he shall make atonement for the house. And it shall be clean. What? How do you make atonement for a house? That doesn't make any sense. That's an inanimate object. What does that mean? You have the Old Testament concept of complete holiness. God's desire was for a clean people in a clean world. What Leviticus is doing is just not pointing us to what's going to happen in the New Testament. Leviticus is pointing to us what's going to happen in the future, in the eternal state. That's what this is doing. There must be, for complete holiness, God's desire was to have a clean people. There must be a clean people, even more with the Lord God in the midst of Israel. All ground became holy ground, because he was in their midst. He was there. So how do you maintain his holiness? Everyone, everyone, everything, everything had to be clean, had to be holy. Only the redemptive work of God in Jesus Messiah will finally achieve a holy new creation where God will dwell with a clean, even holy people in a clean, even holy world. That's what, that's what Leviticus is doing. For God to be there with his people, everything had to be holy, whether it's a house or a person, and you have to make atonement for that. So what's that doing? What's it telling us? If God's going to be with people, that's what needs to happen. And one day it will. Completely, it'll be done. And we await not just are we thankful that we're on this side of the cross, but we can now look at the cross, going, looking back at the cross and what Christ has done, we now look forward to what? The future. To what Christ is going to finally accomplish when he brings everything under himself. And as we read in Revelation chapter 21, God will dwell with his people. No tabernacle with us. And there will be no barriers. Because everything will be clean. That's what the text is telling us. You can be restored. We can be thankful. We can show thanks to God for what He's done for us. Let's do that. We are thankful to God that you keep clean us and purifying us. Find us faithful. Help us to be faithful. Make us faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and sing. You've come to Christ this morning, you want to come forward, please share that. If you've repented, or you see you must be baptized, you can remember here for seven, you may come forward as well. Let's sing together though, read thou my vision in response to our truth.
God, we do thank you for the opportunity to come together as a body of believers this morning to hear and to be focused and to be pointed back to you and what you will do through your son Jesus Christ. When he comes again, God, we just ask that we would be a people who seek your face, who seek your kingdom to become, and who seek to show the love of Christ in these days that you have given us. Praise you, our God and Father, for what you have done. Now give us joy as we leave this place 